At a time of big data, we not just need new rules, we also need a new kind of social responsibility, data responsibility. So what do I mean by data responsibility? Well, let's consider what happened in Nepal. Last year, April 25th, 2015, Nepal got hit by a devastating earthquake. Hundreds of villages turned into dust. Thousands of people were made homeless. At the Mount Everest, huge avalanches killed at least 22 people, making it the worst day on the mountain. Century-old buildings collapsed, devastated forever. And the ultimate toll of what is called the Gorkha earthquake meant that more than 9,000 people were killed and 22,000 people were injured. Yet, despite the devastation and despite the calamity of the earthquake, more damage, more people could have been killed. This is what happened. Encel, which is the largest telecom operator in Nepal, decided to share its data with a non-profit based in Sweden, Flowminder. Flowminder took the data and turned it into a real-time interactive map that showed the inflow and outflow of populations across Nepal, enabling governments and emergency agencies to better target their aid and relief to those who were in need and those who ultimately could have suffered from the earthquake. This is an example of data responsibility, where a private corporation felt a duty to share its own data in order to serve the public interest. We have, unfortunately, not that many examples of data responsibility, where corporations are sharing their own data, yet there are a few examples that I want to share today that show the potential impact of data responsibility with regard to improving people's lives. In Jakarta, Indonesia, Twitter decided to share its own data in order to map massive flooding as a result of the annual monsoon. And this enabled a better and a more agile warning and response system. Similarly, in Senegal, Orange, which is the French telecom operator active in the region, decided to launch an innovation challenge, which is called Data for Development. At the challenge, Orange shared its data with teams of researchers that could identify patterns and solutions to a range of development objectives, ranging from healthcare, agriculture, energy, to even building national statistics. The winning team of Data for Development managed to use mobile data in order to identify energy needs across Senegal, enabling the country of Senegal for the first time to become smarter about how to build an energy infrastructure for the future. Here in the US, Uber has decided to share and donate its own data with the city of Boston, allowing the city to see the movement and patterns of the Bostonians throughout the day. This allows the city of Boston to improve its own urban planning and even improve public transportation. So these are examples where corporations have decided to act upon a duty to share in order to improve people's lives. But we have to be realistic. And some of you might already feel quite uncomfortable about corporations starting to sharing data because sharing data also implies certain risks. So the first pillar, the duty to share with regard to data responsibility, needs to be complemented with the second pillar, which is the duty to protect. Because without protecting the data in a responsible manner, data can be more harmful than beneficial. Let me explain with another example. In New York, the Taxi and Limousine Commission collects from all taxi companies, including Uber and Lyft, data with regard to pickup and drop-off times, with regard to the cost of a ride, and with regard to also what was the tip that the driver got or got at the end of the, of the ride. In 2013, 
TLC was requested to open up its data. And TLC subsequently complied and started sharing the data in what they thought was a responsible manner. Yet, within weeks, civic hackers managed to combine the data from TLC with other data sets, suddenly unleashing new insights that worried privacy advocates. For instance, they managed to identify how much each taxi driver earned on an annual basis. They also managed to identify how celebrities are moving around in the city. And even worse, they also started to identify which gentlemen ultimately frequented on a regular basis gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> More worrying even was that they also managed to identify which taxi drivers were ultimately Muslim and which of them were practicing more than the others. While this might upset New Yorkers, while this might even embarrass a few of them, imagine that this data set, or a kind of data set, was released in a context and in a country where there is ethnic conflict or where there is no tolerance with regard to this kind of behavior. This would not have meant just a privacy concern. This could have meant the difference between death or a life. So for that reason, we need, especially if we apply data in different kinds of contexts, we need a duty to protect. But this duty to protect is not just about privacy at the point of sharing. This is about mitigating risks across the data lifecycle, from the collection stage, to the processing stage, to the sharing stage, the analyzing and the using stage, because at each stage there are risks involved, and if you don't deal with the risk at the time of the stage, it might have a cascading effect. For instance, if you collect inaccurate data at the collection stage, then ultimately your analysis will be far limit, more limited than, than it could be, and it might even lead to uh, harmful decisions and ultimately the use of data that might not be appropriate. So we need a new data responsible framework for duty to protect in order to make sure that ultimately data is being used in the public interest. Now, we have seen that data responsibility comprises of the first pillar, a duty to share, the second pillar, a duty to protect, but that's even not enough in order to assure that data can be used to solve public problems. We also need a duty to act. Because too often, we have a variety of data projects where they unleash new insights that could be beneficial for society, but we see that no one acts upon it. So we need a responsiveness, which is part of the data responsibility paradigm, a responsiveness to actually act upon the data and the insights that are being generated. For instance, there is no shortage these days of portals and websites where they try to document corruption in society. In Brazil, there is a portal called the Transparency Portal that is developed by the government of Brazil to show and present fiscal transparency of all the federal public servants in Brazil. The portal has become the main tool for investigating corruption in Brazil and has already been constantly in the headlines, as you all might know. Similarly, in Mexico, there is a portal that tries to show the performance of all the schools across Mexico, enabling parents to make better decisions about the schooling of their kids. But more importantly, the portal is also being used to identify corruption in Mexico in the education sector. And for instance, thanks to the data that was released at the portal, one could identify that more than 500 online education initiatives took place in areas where there was no electricity, let alone internet access. That more than 70 teachers earned more than the president of Mexico, and that almost 1,500 teachers that were still on the payroll happened to be older than 100 years, and that they all were born on 12-12-1912. Now, has this made any difference? Have we seen less corruption as a result of more data? 
What happens, unfortunately, is that the latest Transparency International report clearly states that corruption remains a big headache for our society. And that even in the case of Brazil, corruption has deteriorated. Similarly, in Mexico, there's a clear understanding that transparency does not automatically lead to accountability, that it actually might be the opposite. And so for that reason, data responsibility needs to be based upon three pillars, a duty to share, a duty to protect, but also a duty to act, because you have to implement them at the same time, because otherwise data might be a lost asset for society especially if you want to use data for the public good. So the question is then, how do we achieve data responsibility in the current age of data? Well, clearly shifting from shielding data to sharing data, or shifting from traditional policy making to actually data-driven policy making, will require a paradigm shift. It will require a cultural shift and a multi-pronged approach which I won't elaborate uh, because we don't have the time. But there are two important steps that we can do in the short term that would make a difference. First of all, organizations can appoint within their organization a data steward. That is not a data scientist, it is a data steward who ultimately can help organizations make the change towards data responsibility, help them Think about when is it appropriate and when is it necessary to start sharing your data because it could improve people's lives. And how would you do it? And ultimately, how do you follow up once you have generated certain insights as a result? And the second element we can do today is really create a movement around data responsibility by demanding the organizations that we interact with on a daily basis, whether they are public or private, demanding data responsibility so that ultimately the data that we have and that is being collected by all kinds of organizations becomes a force for good. Without public pressure, we won't see this ultimately shift that we want to have. And so for all of you in the audience that are passionate about changing the world or improving society, I suggest that you all either develop or demand this new kind of social responsibility, which is data responsibility. Thank you very much.